My name is Tom Warner. I'm a professor of clinical neurology. I work in London at the Institute of Neurology, which is part of um, University College London. I've been working with dystonia for almost 30 years now. I was a junior doctor at the National Hospital at Queen's Square and it was on one of their grand rounds where they had a dystonia case, which I'd not heard of before, which just shows we were trained neurologists didn't know at that stage. And that was with Professor David Marsden and um, Professor Anita Harding, who turned out to be my supervisors after that. And we saw this rather complicated case and it was fascinating, distressing seeing the case because we had even fewer treatments in those days and it just spurred me on to know more, which then led on to my PhD looking at the genetics of these forms. Since that time, I've done various forms of research. At the turn of the century, we worked across eight European countries doing an epidemiological study of dystonia, which was useful just to try and get some figures on the map of how common this might be. And then since that time, I've done more looking at what happens within brain cells in dystonia and also looking at some of the more common types, trying to document the clinical features. And one of the key things about dystonia, unlike a lot of other neurological disorders, is brain cells don't die. They just aren't working properly. And it's probably quite a subtle problem in the pathways in the brain that control how we move that leads to too many muscles being activated and you get dystonic movements and spasms and tremor. And it, some of the work we did suggested it was the way that one brain cell talks to another via what we call the synapse when they release chemical messengers across that may be subtly faulty. Other work through groups who are doing similar works in the States and um, now in Belgium are looking at the way pro proteins are processed in the brain. And we're doing a little bit of work now, <clears throat> we started again because there's some newer technology where you can take skin cells from people turn them into stem cells, so these are the cells which you get in embryos, and then you can basically grow neurons in a dish. And we're doing that for the commonest genetic form of dystonia, so we can get lots of cultures of neurons or brain cells of different types. And then one of the ways which um, industry uses to try and identify possible targets for treatments is we look at the transcriptome. Now this is basically the, um, when you translate the genetic code into proteins, it goes via what's called a transcript and you can have an idea of how proteins and are regulated by looking at those. And what we're trying to say, is there a dystonia signature which suggests that some proteins are up-regulated, others are down-regulated? Uh, and so we'll be doing that in neurons from people with DYT1, which is the commonest genetic form of dystonia. We're going then going to try and validate that because scouring the brain banks in the world, we've got some people who died usually quite late in life who had DYT1 dystonia, we've got and donated their brains to science, we've got some of that tissue to see if what we found in our cultures can be reproduced in the, you know, real brains. And then the next step ahead beyond that is looking how relevant is that to what we find in people with the more common forms of dystonia like cervical dystonia or torticollis or writer's cramp. Is that a real issue? And if you've got this sort of data, that's what sometimes can interest um, pharmaceutical or industry to say what of our 100,000 compounds might get that signature back to normal. The progress has been made, if you look at the last 25 years or the time I've been involved in dystonia, it's slow but steady. I think it's the best way of describing. We can't say it's been astronomically fast, it's not been huge penicillin moments, but it, it's slow incremental building up, which for people with dystonia is not good enough. They did, they'd rather something big happened. And part of the reason is the recognition, part of the reason is people can't say how many cases there are. Um, and I think one of the things that's often cited which really underestimates the problems with dystonia is that, well, it's just the neck muscles pulling or it's just cramps. Uh, and that belies the whole problem that you don't realize the other factors which dystonia causes. So if it's the neck, there's pain as well. If it's the neck, your head pulls and moves when you don't want it to. It's socially stigmatizing. And that's more of a problem because most of the general public don't know what dystonia is. So if someone walking down the street sees someone with Parkinson's, quite likely they'll know what that is. They see someone with dystonia whose eyes are blinking or screwing up or their head's twitching, they won't know and think, hmm, it's a bit strange. So th there's a huge social effect. And we know from studies we did around the time of the epidemiology anxiety, mood disturbance are, very, are much more common in people with dystonia. And I think one of the pits of work, which uh, um, I'm shamelessly going to say it again, is which I think was really important, was we looked at people with neck dystonia, with cervical dystonia, 
<clears throat> and we use the very standard quality of life scales which are used across all forms of medicine, all across neurology. And we looked at their scores and we compared them to people with Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. And people with cervical dystonia felt as disabled and um, in life for a number of reasons as with Parkinson's and MS. So in, you know, people may think it's a few muscles, but it has a huge effect. So we need to get better about treatments. And treatments, I st we study these rare genetic forms and we, th we, we know they're rare because we can sometimes get a handle, which is what we're hoping will then um, contribute to understanding the much more common forms. So it may be that with technology coming through, we might get treatment for the more severe genetic generalized dystonias before we get them for the focal dystonias. Every year now, there'll be a few incurable conditions in, across different specialties, but in, dysto in um, neurology, where there'll be a sort of light bulb moment where someone does something very clever with genetics. And one which is brewing in the background is Huntington's disease, where they can switch off the bad gene, which may be a, a very important way. Probably the most one that's hit most of the news is actually for a form of muscular dystrophy. I'd say it's called spinal muscular atrophy and can affect all sorts of people, but particularly young children, and it's fatal. And the gene therapy of that now, um, it's being licensed across the world. It's incredibly expensive, but they stopped the trials early because it had such a dramatic effect that they couldn't justify completing the trials. So the, this is something where something which was, we thought it might be an option, turned out to be very effective. And it's possible, I think we're talking 10 plus years, but for some of the genetic forms of dystonia, that may well be something that will be coming about. There's a lot more interest, there's a lot more industry interest in um, doing gene therapy of one sort or another, like switching off a bad gene or upping the regulation of a good gene. And that's becoming technically more possible. I think what the hope is, is that what we learn from that sort of thing will be valuable for treating the other people with more, severe, with more focal dystonias. For someone with dystonia or someone who's um, looking after a patient with dystonia is, don't let dystonia define you. You have to define the dystonia. For the majority of people who are adults who get a focal dystonia, it's, I sort of feel it's a bit like you've got a job you never applied for, you've got an unwanted career you didn't apply for, but then someone has given to you, and you have to find a way of dealing with that and living with it. And it's easy for me to say, but um, it often needs more support. It's not necessarily a neurologist's support, that actually you can live with it and you can have a, as normal a life as you'll allow yourself to have. For more severe dystonia, it's the same, but the problems are bigger and more magnified. And you know, I think the thing is it has to be dealt as a condition in the round. It's not just the physical, it's not just the spasms, it's all the other effects that go with it. But um, dystonia is there to be, is there to be taught how to calm down.